Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another edition of With the Prophet. I'm Ali Coleman, I'll be your host. Joining us from Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Asim Al Hakim. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for being with us, brother, to continue part two of our discussion about non Muslims, uh, looking at how the Prophet, peace be, peace be upon him, interacted with non Muslims during his life. Uh, in the first part of this, we covered some good territory. And just a few more things I'd like to ask about. We touched on in the first episode about his efforts to create a harmonious society. People were migrating, running for their lives, literally. And when they arrived, there were people there. And of course, it was a very critical moment in Islamic history. He wanted to set, resettle himself, peace be upon him, and the, his companions. Characterize for us the steps he took to create this peace and harmony, uh, uh, this peaceful coexistence with non, the, the pre-existing non-Muslims, Jews, uh, Arab, uh, pagans, and others. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een amma ba'd. As you've mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ, when he migrated with his companions, mm. their numbers grew because there were Muslims already in Medina of mm -hmm. the original in inhabitants. Okay. So Islam and the Muslims became a majority. Usually, mm -hmm. when you don't have a religion or a set of ethics governing your actions, the norm is to kick anyone else outside, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to expel them, because they don't fit with us and we don't fit with them. This wasn't the case with the Prophet ﷺ. It was reported in the Sira books that the Prophet signed a treaty, peace be upon him, with the Jews so that no injustice would be done to either party. Okay. So mm -hmm. they had the right to practice their religion. They had the right to trade, to coexist. But the main point that was highlighted was that they would not betray the Muslims. Okay. They would not assist mm -hmm. the enemies of Muslims against Islam and the Muslims. And almost that was it. Mm. So the Prophet والسلام, did not confiscate their properties. On the contrary, he, on the contrary, he left them to work, to be positive, to be beneficial to the community. And he also honored his agreement with them until they betrayed. Okay. So he didn't kill any one of them. Though there were suspicions until they betrayed. Mm -hmm. And he allowed them to practice their own religion. This is their God-given right. There's no compulsion in religion, meaning that people do not have to be forced to accept Islam. Okay. It is so clear mm -hmm. to everyone that Islam is the only divine religion that is from Allah Azza wa Jal. But we don't force them if they don't want to accept Islam, yet we treat them as non-Muslims as well. So very important part. I, I, this is actually very important to know that when the Muslims all arrived, they constituted a majority. Uh, and as we were discussing, this is easy to do if we remember what the demographers have told us that the human global population did not reach one billion until just 200 years ago. It's easy to uh, become overnight a majority population by a mass migration. Uh, and so this, this is what we have. And uh, you're saying to us that after the Prophet, peace be upon him, arrived, he was respectful, uh, and it makes sense. I, those Jews and others who were there are in a very critical, sensitive position. They're insiders now, and if they wanted to, they could betray and cause the collapse, the ruin of the early Muslims. Uh, you mentioned, you touched on the subject of justice. <clears throat> um, were there cases that uh, came before him where he would have to, peace be upon him, 
uh, rule over disputes between uh, Muslim and non-Muslim, between himself and religious leaders, or however, when we talk about justice, doing justice to them, is it is it not is it more than just uh, honoring their pre-existing beliefs and lifestyle? Is it also resolving disputes? Well, the Prophet والسلام, and there is one or two incidents that I may think of or <laughs> try to improvise. One was that the Prophet saw once alayhi salatu wasalam um, a group of Jews with a boy and a girl accused of fornication. Okay. So the Prophet asked them alayhi salatu wasalam about this and they told him. And they asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to judge according to the law of Allah. So the Prophet asked them alayhi salatu wasalam, what does your books say about it? And they said that we put tar on their faces and li like in the Wild West, maybe feathers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and put them uh, back to back on a mule and take them around the, the city. Mm. And they showed him the Torah, but the Prophet doesn't read Arabic, let alone Hebrew. Mm. So one of their rabbis who accepted Islam, Abdullah ibn Salam, may Allah be pleased with him, who became a companion, told them to remove their hands from the verse that the man was trying to cover, which stated stoning. Mm. So when he did, then it was obvious that the ruling was to stone. And the Prophet ordered والسلام, them to be stoned. According to not only Islam, but also according to the Bible, to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And if you go through the Old Testament, see a lot of the non-Muslims accuse the Muslims of being harsh, being barbaric for the punishment, pre, uh, prescribed punishment of stoning. Yeah. Though if you go through the Old Testament, you'll find that it is in a number of things. It's there, yeah. You stone whoever curses uh, or slanders the king. You stone a child who is disobedient to his parents. The elders are told to take him to the outskirts of the village and stone him to death. Mm. You stone someone who has a sexual relationship with the daughter of a priest. Mm. You stone even an ox, an animal, if he kills someone. You, there are so many things. Yeah. I, I, this is not the show to, to make it co a comparative uh, between Islam and, and, and Judaism, for example, or Christianity. But this is in their books. So stoning was there. The Prophet solved the dispute that the Jews came to him trying to cheat the Prophet ﷺ so that he would give them a, a lenient punishment other than what is in their books. Also, um, uh, one of the companions was once assassinated at the gates of Khaybar, which is a village for the Jews. So the son of this companion and his two uh, uncles, mm -hmm. the brothers, the siblings of the companion, who was uh, assassinated, came to the Prophet ﷺ and they're saying, O Prophet of Allah, the Jews must have killed him. Now, if you're the ruler and you have justice in your hands and you know the enmity between the Jews and the Muslims, you would definitely say that you're right. No one could kill him except the Jews and he was killed at their gate, gates and, 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 and walls. So definitely they're the one who killed him, mm. but not the Prophet ﷺ. Okay. <clears throat> How did he react? He would not be unfair or he would not show any form of injustice, though they are the enemies of Islam. He told them, it is very simple. Can you swear by Allah that they killed him? The companion said, how would we do such a thing? We did not see it. Mm -hmm. In this case, the Prophet said, 50 of them, of the Jews, would swear that they did not kill him. The companion said, the oh, Prophet of Allah, they're disbelievers. They would swear. They don't fear Allah. 
He said, I, I cannot help it. Either you provide the evidence or I cannot accuse them. Mm -hmm. I have to acquit them. Yeah. So this shows you the amount of fairness and justice the Prophet had, alayhi salatu wasalam. One of the companions, and his name is Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais, in Yemen, disputed with a Jew over a piece of land. So they escalated it and went to the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. And they told him, as a companion, O Prophet of Allah, this land is mine. And this Jew claims it's his. In a Muslim court, this is a Muslim against a non-Muslim. Mm -hmm. If there was any bias or injustice, the result would be known. At the time of the Prophet والسلام, he said to Al-Ash'ath, do you have any proof, documentation, witnesses, anything to prove that this is your land? And he said, no. So the Prophet awarded it to the Jew because the Jew had a house. Mm. The Jew lived in it. Mm. So in order for you to verify this, you have to bring your evidences. Again, this shows us how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with them as non-Muslims, as if he's dealing with mm. Muslims mm. as well. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a break now, Sheikh. When we come back, interesting question about s Jews sneezing in the presence of the, of the Prophet, peace be upon him. We'll get the Sheikh's answer after a break. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to With the Prophet. We're continuing with Sheikh Asim in our discussion about non-Muslims who lived with the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, sneezing Jews. Uh, you know, when I first heard about this, uh, someone was saying that the Jews, certain Jews around the Prophet, peace be upon him, had a habit of sneezing in his presence. I thought to myself, is this kind of like, you know, when crass people in the street, rude people, poor mannered people are spit in your presence as a form of disrespect or whatever? Is that what was going on? What was that all about? Well, first of all, we have to understand the relationship between the Jews and Islam in general. It is stated in the Quran that the Jews believed in the prophecy that there will come a prophet whom they will fight with all other nations and prevail under his flagship. And they believed that the Prophet was a prophet of Allah. Yet out of envy, they refused to follow him. And when they were asked, they would say, yes, we know he's a prophet, but he's not the prophet that we were told to come mm. because he's not from the offspring of Isaac. Mm -hmm. Rather, he's of the offspring of Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And they were lying. Two sons of Ibrahim. Yes. They are lying because the prophet they will follow as we believe as Muslims, is the Antichrist or the Dajjal, mm. the uh, imposter Christ who will come at the end of time. The Prophet told us والسلام, that 70,000 Jews from Asfahan, from Iran, would follow him. And it is shocking, but this is what's happening in Iran at the moment. The Jews are settling. They have certain type of clothes that they'll wear and they're preparing for the, the coming of their so-called prophet. So they know that the prophet was a prophet of Allah. Abdullah ibn Salam, may Allah be pleased with him, was one of their best rabbis. He said, when I heard of him coming to Jed, to, sorry, when I've heard him coming to Medina, mm. And by the way, Medina and Jeddah is 400 kilometers apart, so it's our neighborhood. He said, I went to look at his face. I'm a good character of, uh, I'm a good... Uh, uh, um, Evaluating. A, yeah, mm. by, by, by character, a character of people, mm -hmm. a good judge of character. Mm. So he says, I went, and he was preaching the people. Abdullah ibn Salam, a Jew, says, the moment I looked into his face, I know it was not the face of a liar. Hmm. So he accepted Islam on the spot, went to the Prophet and said, O Prophet of Allah, I bear witness 
and he read the testimony. So the Prophet was happy. Then Abdullah said, O Prophet of Allah, you know that the Jews are people of deceit and lying. So I'd like you to invite them and ask them about me while I hide behind the curtain. So the Prophet invited them and he asked them, what do you think of Abdullah ibn Salam? So they said, he's one of our most righteous, knowledgeable, mm. and the son of one of our most righteous and knowledgeable. Mm. Abdullah ibn Salam came out. Okay. And he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu Muhammadan Rasulullah. Immediately they flipped and said, he is the worst <laughs> of us and the son of the worst of us. So this shows you that this is their character. Mm. This is the way they behave. Mm. Now, let me go back to your question because I forgot it. The sneezing. <laughs> okay. Now, having said that, and they know about the Prophet, mm -hmm. though they did not follow him, they used to do something that was awkward. When they were in the presence of the Prophet, they used to pretend that they sneeze. Why? Pretending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in Islam, if I sneeze, the sunnah and the etiquette is to say, Alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. Praise be to Allah. Allah. Now, it's an obligation upon you because you heard me sneeze and praise Allah at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's obligation upon you to say to me, Yarhamukumullah. May Allah have mercy upon you. Okay. So it's an exchange of dua, of invocations mm. and, and supplications. Okay. The Jews wanted to hear this from the Prophet So mm. they used to sneeze and say, Alhamdulillah. Ah, just so that uh, he could uh, bless them or make supplications. With mercy. I see. And the Prophet would only say, may Allah guide you and rectify your affairs. <laughs> and this shows us that the Muslims are permitted, mm. are allowed mm -hmm. to make dua for non-Muslims okay. of any good thing in this worldly life. So may Allah grant this person cure of his illness, may Allah make him healthy, may Allah make him successful in his job, in his education, may Allah rectify his affairs. What is not permissible for Muslims to do is, is to seek Allah's forgiveness or to ask Allah Azza wa Jal for mercy and paradise. This mm. we cannot do to the non-Muslims. So even if I have uh, um, non-Muslim uh, parents, I cannot say, oh Allah forgive their sins. Mm. Oh Allah admit them to Jannah. Mm. Oh Allah have mercy on them. This is totally prohibited. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I can do is, oh Allah guide them. Oh Allah oh, expand their chest. Oh Allah open their heart to love Islam and to become Muslims consistently. And inshallah, this is okay. Thank you for clearing that up about the sneezing. Uh, it, it almost sounded juvenile when it first came across. Was the prophet, I, I'm wondering about, um, I mean, obviously, there were a lot of people who were not happy with him, peace be upon him, despite his humility, his, his, his great love and compassion for human beings. Uh, there were people who hated him. They, they wanted him dead. Uh, and that included, you know, uh, people in arms, uh, uh, but also they employed other means, mm -hmm. like the woman in the earlier, ep earlier uh, tried to poison him. Um, and then there were magicians, sorcerers. W what was that all about? Were they trying to kill him, manipulate him? Uh, what was the, the use of magic against the prophet all about? Peace be upon him. Okay, first of all, the issue of magic is something that is mentioned in the Quran. So no Muslim can reject it. And the biggest and most clear story of all is the story of Moses, peace be upon him, with the sorcerers of Pharaoh. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, you're saying that for a reason, uh, with the knowledge that some Muslims don't accept that magic is real, is that? Correct, not some Muslims, a very minute uh, uh, amount or percentage of not real Muslims, those who were affected by uh, the philosophy of the Greek those who followed the deviant sects and cults like Al-Mu'tazila uh, uh, and, and the likes who reject a lot of the unseen. I see. Now, Sihr, which is sorcery, 
is mentioned in the Quran. Okay. And Moses, who is one of the strong-willed messengers of Allah, the five strong-willed messengers of Allah, was mentioned in the Quran to be affected by it. So we will not go into magic in details, but there is a type of magic that is known as imagination. Mm -hmm. So it's a spell that makes you feel something that is not true or see, as in the case of Moses, peace be upon him, something that is not true. Mm -hmm. They threw their staff, they threw their ropes, and the spell was there to make him think that these were actual snakes. Mm -hmm. Then he was intimidated, as mentioned in the Quran, and Allah Azza wa Jal made his heart steadfast by telling him that, don't be afraid, you are the highest, you will prevail and you'll win. Mm -hmm. The Prophet ﷺ had a similar spell and it was, some say two months, it was, some say six months, some say a few days. The period itself is not that uh, uh, accurate, but the story is authentic. It's in Bukhari, it's in Muslim, it's in the whole nine yards. Mm. It stated that the Prophet ﷺ used to enter his homes and this was the spell. And he used to believe that he had intimacy with his wives while well, he didn't. Mm. So the spell was not in his intellect, in his memory, in Quran, in halal and haram teaching. No, no, no. It was not related to the religion none of, at all. It was something physical and mental, as if it's an illness, a virus. So he used to think that he had intercourse with his wives when, when he didn't, and his wives were you know, felt strange. Why is the Prophet not like what he used to be? Mm -hmm. Until he says himself, I was asleep, and then a man stood at my head and another stood at my feet. And they started the dialogue. What's wrong with the man? The other one says, he is sick. And the other one says, what off? He said there was a spell cast upon him. In what? In a uh, um, few pieces of his hair and his calm put in a special branch of um, uh, a palm tree. Where at? It's at the well of so and so. Mm -hmm. Whom by? It's by Labid ibn al Asam, who was a Jew. So the Prophet woke up, the two men were obviously uh, Jibreel and Israfil, the <laughs> angels of Allah informing him in a form of a revelation. So he instructs his companions to go and to that well and to go deep and get the things that were his belongings and he ordered them to be burnt out. Mm -hmm. The norm is to execute this person who did this shameful act to harm the Prophet mm. But he failed. The Prophet did not kill him. In an authentic hadith, the Prophet even went ex the extra mile. The hadith says that the Prophet never showed it in his face whenever he met this Jew and never talked with him about it. So neither he reprimanded him nor informed him that I found out what you had done or punished him. Nothing. The Prophet simply moved on. And this shows you how he treated the non-Muslims. And thereafter, this uh, uh, hallucination, I don't know what to call it, the spell was lifted. Of course, it was mm. lifted, and mm. then the Prophet was given the last uh, two chapters of the Quran, 113 and 114, which is Surah Al-Falaq and Surah An-Nas, to protect and preserve him and us, because this is what we recite after every Salat once, after uh, uh, Fajr and Maghrib, the evening and morning adhkar three times, uh, along with Qul Huwa Allah Had, chapter 112. This is a form of protection if you maintain to you to say your adhkar after salat, five mandatory prayers, before going to bed, before going out, and in the morning, in the evening, you are not virus protected, 
like in the, the PCs, but you are protected from the jinn, from the evil life, from see. everything bad. Uh, these spiritual, intangible things. Uh, Sheikh, we have run out of time. A couple things left over. Oh, we do plan in a future uh, episode to talk about some other uh, uh, subjects that maybe we can get, get them in, uh, dealing with congratulating uh, okay. and celebrating with non-Muslims, uh, accepting gifts from, non from non-Muslims. Uh, thank you so much for opening up this subject for us. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah accept our efforts and thank you for being with us. We hope it was beneficial for you. We look forward to continuing with the Prophet in the future. Until then, assalamu alaikum.